Welcome, uh, welcome to all of you. This is a dazzling turnout and, uh, of people who are uh, uh, supporters, collaborators, co-religionists with us at the Journalism School. It's a tremendous uh, pleasure and an honor to welcome you here tonight. I'm Edward Wasserman, I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism here at UC Berkeley, uh, the, which is the home of the investigative reporting program with which we are co-sponsoring this event tonight. I've been admonished to remind you to turn off your cell phones uh, because this is being recorded. Well, everything's being recorded nowadays, isn't it? But <laughs> it's being deliberately recorded and knowingly recorded. Uh, tonight's talk is the first of a series of events that J School will be hosting to mark an upcoming 50th anniversary of great cultural and political significance. It was in 1964, as the civil rights movement was peaking, that a brilliant leader named Mario Savio and other Berkeley students inaugurated a legendary era of activism and political mobilization, making headlines worldwide and launching what is now called the free speech movement. And now it's almost 50 years later, and we face another fight over expressive freedoms, this one involving the press. Uh, at issue is the ability of the press at a time of staggering electronics encroachment and surveillance to ensure that people who know things that people should hear can reveal what they know without fear of reprisal. These are indeed, as most of you know, dark days when it comes to informational freedom. The ferocity, the shocking and, un and surprising ferocity of the Obama administration assault on those who defy its secrecy rules is literally without precedent. So far, we've got seven Obama Justice Department prosecutions under the Espionage Act, the 1917 law that had been used a total of three times before now, seven and counting, eight if you include Edward Snowden, the ex-contractor of the National Security Agency who has now sought refuge in, of all places, Russia, nine with Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, the anti-secrecy network, if he is indeed under indictment as is generally assumed. So what are these cases? Typically, they involve government employees or contractors who learned of things they found disturbing, such as what the New York Times called, quote, a potential billion dollar computer boondoggle. Some tried getting attention through official channels without success. Sometimes they provided information in response to press queries, such as the ex-CIA agent who gave defense lawyers the name of a Guantanamo interrogator, and he got 30 months. The best known case was the court martial of Bradley Manning, now known as Chelsea, the Army private accused of engineering the mammoth dumps of US military and diplomatic data that WikiLeaks turned over to leading news media in 2010 and 2011. Manning got 35 years. Now, none of these, none of these are espionage cases in the sense that we normally understand espionage. These are not Aldrich Ames or Burgess and McLean or Robert Hansen, furtive, deliberate thefts of sensitive information for the purpose of selling it or making it available to enemies. Indeed, these are all cases of information that the government had declared secret that wasn't sold or brokered, but simply made public without intent to harm. The intent was to expose things in the belief people should know about them. That's what journalism is all about. In that respect, the administration isn't jailing spies, it's criminalizing news sources. Elsewhere in the civilized world, punishments for disclosing state secrets are less than you get here for drunk driving. At worst, two years in Britain and Denmark. In other Western countries, maximum punishments range from four years in Sweden and Spain to five in Germany, Belgium, and Poland, and seven in France. Not only are penalties mild, prosecutions are rare. In six countries of 20 surveyed in a recent study, nobody in the past decade had been convicted of disclosing state secrets. In Britain, since the 1989 Official Secrets Act took effect, only 10 public employees have been prosecuted. The longest sentence went to a naval petty officer who sold intelligence to a newspaper about a possible Iraqi anthrax attack, and he got one year. Apart from the US, the only country where prosecutions are common is Russia. Unlike our courts, Europe's courts seem to be moving towards support for whistleblowers, even when state security is breached. 
In a 1996 case, after a military intelligence official in Romania got two years for releasing tapes of illicit wiretaps his agency had made, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that he was wrongly convicted. Why? Because, the court said, he was acting in good faith by exposing illegalities to the public. And the public's interest in learning about the wrongdoing outweighed the agency's interest in avoiding embarrassment. There, public benefit was the defense against secrecy violations. That's a principle that doesn't exist in US law. Still, in this country, the public seems to have a very different understanding than our government does. A survey in May of US voters found a huge margin, 55 to 34% considered Edward Snowden a whistleblower, not a traitor. The public also seems to be ahead of the news media on this. It's surprising how limp the media's response has been to whistleblower prosecutions, even when they've benefited from the information that was leaked. Assange has been transformed into a faintly ridiculous figure. Whistleblowers like him are routinely pathologized and marginalized. But we're not here tonight to focus on whistleblowers, Still, let's remember, our guest for this event has been targeted not because the government is after him, but because it's after the man it believes was his source. The other prosecutions relied on evidence gathered through the kind of surveillance, electronic surveillance that our guests tonight and others, including Edward Snowden, have exposed. But in this case, which we'll hear more about in a few minutes, that's not enough. Prosecutors say they need Jim Risen's testimony. Nailing the person alleged to have been his source requires a frontal assault on a foundational element of press freedom. The ability of journalists to ensure the indispensable flow of publicly significant information by protecting the identity of people who bring that information to light. That's why Jim is at the center of a fiercely contested front in the battle for press freedom. We're honored to have him here. Jim is an investigative reporter, as, well, as you all know, with the New York Times covering national security and intelligence. He's a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize, won for his 2006 investigation with fellow reporter Eric Lichtblau that exposed the National Security Agency's warrantless wiretapping program. Jim is also the author of three books. Asking the questions tonight and engaging in conversation with him is our own Lowell Bergman, director of the investigative reporting program, and the Riva and David Logan, distinguished professor of investigative reporting at the journalism school. Lowell is also a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and a longtime producer and correspondent for the PBS documentary series Frontline. And in a brush with celebrity, he was the subject of The Insider, the Michael Mann movie about Lowell's own fight on behalf of a no, tobacco I'm not Al source. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed that. <laughs> He's stepping on my punchline here, Lowell. <laughs> Uh, his fight on behalf of a tobacco industry insider, a source rather, during his days at 60 Minutes. Lowell was capably impersonated by Al Pacino in the, fi <laughs> in the film. Well, the plan here is that Lowell and Jim will talk for the next 30 minutes and then we'll throw up the questioning to the audience. Thanks for coming, Lowell. Um. Before we get into the, the uh, question and answer, I just wanted to recount an episode in, in my own uh, career as a reporter back in 2006 when Jim uh, broke the story of the NSA eavesdropping. And um, uh, many people in Congress, as well as in the Bush administration, were calling for the prosecution of the New York Times under the Espionage Act. Jim, of course, is a, as the first defendant. And uh, I went and met with uh, a member of the congressional com one of the congressional committees that supervises the intelligence community. That's their job. And uh, in the conversation, this person, by the way, you know, there's a federal shield law that's been up. There is no sh shield law for us in the federal court, in federal law, but there's been one pending for a long time. And this particular person uh, did not support having the shield law cover national security, which and people like Jim. Uh, at the same time, in the meeting that we were discussing what was going on, the member of Congress looked at me and, and said, while I'm against giving you the national security exemption to protect your sources, at the same time, I want to make it clear that we in, in this watchdog committee really don't have the resources to keep the national security apparatus in line. 
we depend on you, the press, to do that. <laughs> which, which convinced me that, uh, while I was a little amazed by this, that there are members of Congress who can actually keep two opposing ideas in their heads at the same time. <laughs> um, now, a little background with Jim, that just to make sure everyone understands. He's been in the crosshairs of the, um, first the Bush administration, and then the Obama administration and Attorney General Holder for a long time. How many years has this been going on? Five. Five years. He's been the subject of at least three grand juries. Two. Two, okay. Um, and the current situation and the current series of, of cases has taken, I think, a toll that uh, I don't think anybody really understands. So I wanted to really start, Jim, with what has this struggle meant to you personally? Uh, <laughs> That's a long, uh, I could answer that long or short? Oh, uh, your, your choice. <laughs> I think at first it had a big effect on me. It was uh, uh, when I was first subpoenaed in, in 2008, in the, I think it was January 2008, and um, that started the process that has uh, continued. And, and at first I was, uh, it kind of dominated my time and my thoughts and uh, really took a lot out of me to deal with it. There's a lot of back and forth uh, with my lawyers and uh, a lot of procedural things going on uh, early on. But then as it dragged on, it's just kind of become uh, background noise in my life. And uh, you know, I think the, the legal, I've learned more, I feel like I've been going to law school for the last five years, I've learned so much about the legal process, and I learned that it takes forever to do anything. And um, during that process, I've just learned to just to get, get on with my life uh, again. And I find that that's the best way to cope with it and to, to fight back against the government, really, is just to try and uh, not let it get to me anymore. And so that's, to me, it was the best revenge against it was just to not let it dominate my thoughts anymore. But and especially since people like you have been so nice to me, that helps. <laughs> well, actually, we've had Jim out here a number of times, and, and it's sort of the progress of the case. Uh, but for, I think it's clear, you should make it clear, you're not being defended by the New York Times, right? No, no. Why not? Well, the story was in a book, State of War, uh, and my uh, publisher, uh, Simon & Schuster, paid for my lawyers. Uh, for several years, and then my lawyers finally agreed to continue pro bono. So now they're very graciously uh, defending me for free. I should point out that, that the uh, first the Bush administration and now the Obama administration made a point of not going after Jim in, in a, with the grand jury about the seminal story about NSA eavesdropping. What they right. did was they picked a chapter in this in this book that was not published in the New York Times. So that would separate him, separate them from having to go after the New York Times. Right. And could you maybe just summarize what that chapter is about? Yeah, it was a story about how uh, the CIA had um, a CIA operation aimed at the Iranian nuclear weapons program in uh, the end of the Clinton administration, actually, uh, the CIA had a Russian defector who um, they used as a go-between with the Iranians. He um, was ordered by the CIA to give the Iranians nuclear blueprints, blueprints to a nuclear bomb, and the CIA wanted him to go give these to the Iranians. Uh, and what had happened was that they had taken some Russian nuclear designs, bomb designs, and had some uh, experts put some flaws into them so that if the Iranians tried to build this bomb, supposedly it wouldn't work and it would somehow set the Iranians back. But what happened was as soon as they gave these designs to this Russian who was a nuclear, who was a scientist by training, he recognized the flaws immediately because it was so ham done so ham-handedly. And he then wrote a letter to the Iranians saying, I'm giving you flawed designs. 
uh, and uh, so that it was obvious that the program, this operation was mismanaged, that the Iranians were able to figure out what was valuable information in these versus what wasn't. And um, so the operation was kind of an embarrassment to the CIA. So for that, they identified uh, Jeffrey Sterling, right? And, and indicted him. And they assume that, you're, that he's your source. Yeah, that's their assumption. Right. And, <laughs> and initially, you resisted the subpoena, right, as, as you got? Yeah. As I understand that the trial judge then brought back a decision saying that there was some protections for you and you wouldn't necessarily have to testify about the substance of what you knew. The, I was subpoenaed by a grand jury once. First subpoena expired because uh, I think what happened was that the judge, uh, you know, the, the case started in 2008, which was obviously an election year, and it kind of dragged on until 2009, and um, when the Obama people came in, the judge issued an order, issued a uh, ruling saying this grand jury has expired, which makes the subpoena moot, uh, and she gave the new Obama administration 10 days to decide whether or not they wanted to continue to pursue the subpoena. Um, I thought that they were going to drop it, um, but they immediately renewed it and uh, started all over again. And so then I was subpoenaed. Second, the judge said you have to get a new subpoena because there's a new attorney general. Uh, and so they hold her. The first subpoena was issued with the approval of Michael Mukasey, who was the last attorney general of the Bush administration. And the second one was issued by Eric Holder the Attorney General under the Obama administration. And then I was subpoenaed a third time uh, when, or that, that second subpoena was essentially quashed by the district court judge. Uh, and then um, when a, after an indictment and the case started, uh, I was subpoenaed for the, for the actual trial. And so the trial subpoena is the one that uh, the judge again quashed. And then because the, the judge had quashed the subpoena of me, the um, Obama administration decided to, that they so wanted my testimony that they appealed it to the appeals court. So were you surprised during this that the Obama administration would, in fact, continue doing what the Bush administration was doing? I was at first, but I'm not anymore. I mean, I think yeah. because they have. Uh, I think it's part of a broader pattern. They've uh, all of you know. They've basically Obama has endorsed virtually all of Bush's national security policies. There's very little difference between Bush and Obama on anything related to national security. Because he's assumed the same state of war that you were talking about. Yeah, I think that he um, he has made the war on terror, the global war on terror, a bipartisan thing, uh, and I think that really is going to be the the legacy, the enduring legacy of the Obama administration is that he entrenched and endorsed a real change in. Uh, American national security policy. Well, what the court said, well, let, let's do the last chapter here with the one you're facing now. So they went to the Circuit Court of Appeals. Right. I think I remember when you were here last and afterwards when we talked, you didn't, you didn't think that they were going to win. Yeah, I mean, that, that appeals process took forever. It went on, they appealed it in 2011, I think, yeah. And uh, that delayed the trial. And the uh, appeals court didn't decide the case until this summer. So it was almost two years that it was on appeal. Uh, and they, a three judge panel ruled against me and for the government. And so they, um, requ that re their order requires me to testify. But they did more than just come down against you, they said 
that we as journalists do not have a right to protect our sources in any federal criminal proceeding. Right. Yeah, it was a not very sweeping. Not just an sweeping, espionage case, yeah. not this case, any case, any trial we cover where you have a source, we, we do not have a privilege. Right. They don't recognize it, period. Yeah, I think one of the things that surprised me the most about the way the Obama administration has handled this case was when they appealed the lower court's decision to quash the subpoena of me, they didn't just appeal it on kind of a narrow grounds that you could have found in the specifics of our case. The government's briefs to the, to the appeals court were very sweeping and said, and made the point that the Constitution does not have any privilege for reporters at all. And so they turned what was a fairly specific factual case into a real basic constitutional matter that you know we weren't trying to make it into a constitutional matter. The government has done that. Uh, and so that, that's where it stands now. That's why it's become such a broad uh, press freedom issue, I think. Right, a, a danger. Now at the same time that that happened, I did a little reporting before you came out, and talking to reporters in Washington who cover national security, they said that when this opinion came down, they all got phone calls from the Justice Department's chief press representative, all telling them, as other reporters, your colleagues, don't worry, Attorney General Holder is not going to put any reporter in jail. Yeah. Trust us. Yeah. You trust yeah, no, me? I've heard, I heard that at the same time. And uh, the, they'd also just issued new media guidelines for the Attorney General, how they would deal with the media because of the other cases. Yeah, because then it came out that the associate, they were bugging the phones or getting the records of the Associated right. Press, and they were also following this Fox News reporter right. who was trying to get the State Department reporter right. who was trying to get a CIA guy detailed to the State Department to talk to him, to give him information. Right, and so after all this, uh, my lawyers said, okay, well, let's find out, and we sent a letter to the Justice Department. We actually sent a letter to Eric Holder, said, uh, you know, in light of your new media guidelines and everything, um, you know, you seem to have changed your position, and why don't you drop the subpoena of me? And uh, Holder ignored our letter and never responded. And my lawyers called the Justice Department and they just said, we're, we're still going, we'll keep going. And they have uh, not shown any, any sign that they're gonna stop fighting the case. I can't think of any other time in history where the Justice Department and the FBI in this case have actually, maybe since the 1960s, track the press in this particular way. Right, yeah, I, th I think it's, um, there was a period, I think, as you know, the 70s was a kind of a reform era because of Watergate and uh, the church committee and the uh, disclosures about the CIA and other agencies back in the 70s led to a lot of reforms. And what the 9-11 really did was to provide the government with an opportunity to get rid of a lot of those reforms and to change the way national security, uh, the national security apparatus in the government operates. And one of the things that changed was the way they deal with the press. And uh, I think that they've become much more aggressive since 9-11. Well, the and, gloves are off. Basically, there was a, a truce that right. happened in 1976 yeah. where the Justice Department said you can't interrogate a reporter unless you get the personal approval of the Attorney General of the United States. Right. That did not happen until basically you came along. Right, right, right. And, and that uh, truce is over and the government is investigating and is questioning the press and, and investigating our sources our records and so on. Yeah, when I first started covering the CIA in the 90s, uh, it was kind of like that scene in Casablanca, you know, where the, the shock that gambling's going on. Everybody knew what the game was. Everybody knew that, you know, you would write a story, the government would be upset that you got some information, and then they would say, we're going to do a leak investigation, and then you never heard about it anymore. We did a story that led to a leak investigation. Yeah, yes, yes. Right. 
And so that it was this, uh, it was a very, you know, there was, there was not a war going on. It was a, we were benefiting from kind of the ambiguity in the system that nobody really wanted to go to war over these issues. And, uh, but that changed, I think it really started to change with the Plame case when uh, the Valerie Plame case where they brought in a special prosecutor who was kind of not beholden to anybody, Patrick Fitzgerald, and he just decided to start subpoenaing every reporter in town. And I think that broke the, you know, that broke the, the understanding that had existed between the press and the government. And now I think every prosecutor in Washington wants to be the next Pat Fitzgerald. Well, so you're facing jail mm -hmm. at this point. How long before you, have, you may have to go in? Uh, well, we are about to uh, appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, I think we have till January to decide to do that. And then depends on whether the Supreme Court takes the case or not. Um, and if they don't, then the case will go right back to the district court immediately, I guess. And then I would uh, have to be held in contempt. So if the Supreme Court doesn't take the case, the trial might start in early next year? I would guess, yeah. Yeah, so, and then. Although I've learned that every, nothing's fast in this thing, so it could be longer. Could be a while. Right. There are those who say that, the, that, that I talk to who say that uh, the appeal to the Fourth Circuit resulted in bad law. Mm -hmm. Probably the worst press decision out of the federal courts in decades. If you go to the Supreme I Court. I didn't appeal to the, Supreme, to the Fourth Circuit. I mean, that was well, the government. The government did. <laughs> okay, but the case has resulted in that. Mm -hmm. But now if you choose to go to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court takes the case, and it's not exactly a, a liberal Supreme Court, although we're seeing liberals agreeing with conservatives about subpoenaing people like you, mm -hmm. is it possible this will make bad, more bad law for everybody else nationally, make it national and just not a regional decision? Yeah, it's a risk, uh, but I think, you know, we've got to keep fighting. I mean, uh, it's possible, that you, but you never know what kind of law you get. I think it's, at this point, the status quo is so bad for uh, press freedom that I don't think we can stop fighting. I mean, I think, you know, I think what's, it's an interesting issue. I don't know what you can do about it except surrender or fight. And I'm not really, I'm not going to surrender. Well, I, can, I know there's a lot of, there are people out there who would say, you know what this is really about? It's our arrogance as reporters mm -hmm. that we can determine what should be secret and what isn't secret. Mm -hmm. Doesn't the government have a right to its secrets? Because was, you read this book mm -hmm. and it's like their dirty laundry, their deepest, darkest secrets. And then they've seen Julian Assange and, and Manning and WikiLeaks and now it's Snowden. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you know, that's, democracy is messy. It's got it by, by nature. And if you have a government that can do everything in secret and doesn't have to worry about things com coming out in the public, then we'll have much worse corruption. I've had many people in the government tell me that, especially in the intelligence community and in the CIA, they say that one of the tests that they have in their meetings about whether to do something or not is what would this look like if it's on the front page of the New York Times? And if they think this will look really bad, they don't do it. Or at least sometimes they don't do it. <laughs> and that's, that's, the, that's an important check in the system. The accountability of the press, that the press provides to the system, and it's particularly now when Congress is so dysfunctional, there's very little congressional oversight that's uh, worthwhile. And so the press is providing an important check on the system. Well, you know, I, I had an experience the other day that sort of amplifies this also in terms of how integral our ability to protect sources is to actually reporting. So I got a bunch of Senate staffers, won't name who they are, what committee, uh, be, uh, on the phone in a conference call because I have a source who wants to go tell Congress 
what he knows. Mm -hmm. But his question to me was, if I go to Congress, can they protect me in any way if I go in there and it comes out and the information comes out? So I didn't know the answer to the question, so I arranged to do this conference call. And so I'm talking to the staffers on the phone and I'm explaining, generally speaking, what my source knows about, but can you guys protect him in any way? Do you have any kind of way of shielding him from litigation or anything else? Answer, no. We have no way to protect him right. ourselves. And then they said, the, the chief lawyer in the group said, and by the way, we understand this whole conversation is off the record and you'll protect us. All right. All right. <laughs> so in, in a funny way, the, the government is operating in two, uh, uh, across purposes to itself. Right. The, the, the idea that, con that people in the intelligence community can go to the Senate Intelligence Committee or the House Intelligence Committee the way some of, some of these congressmen say on TV, they say, oh, he should have come to us. That's laughable. I mean, it, it's a joke, and they all know it's a joke. They know that no, they could not do that. I remember, since he's dead, I can tell you this story that after one story I did for the New York Times, along with Eric Lischblau, it was about how uh, the CI had, was starting to collect all the banking records through SWIFT of American citizens and others. And uh, our inspector called us, who was a senator from Pennsylvania, and he said, and he was a Republican for that matter at that time, and he said, you know, we should give oversight authority to the New York Times because you're the only ones doing it. Right. Well, you, as I said, you, you hear that it's a refrain. Right. And yet they're, and maybe that's why they're going after you or t and teaching people a lesson right. for talking. So I, before uh, we get into turning this over to questions, I had a couple of uh, update kind of things. You've been doing stories um, in and around the Edward Snowden revelations. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that uh, it's the first time I've ever seen this in a, in a newspaper. You, you did an interview with Snowden, mm -hmm. and it says, in an encrypted interview, mm -hmm. <laughs> Edward yeah. Snowden, blah, blah, blah. Right. So are you encrypting everything now? Uh, encrypting more than I used to, yeah. Uh, you kind of have to. Well, there's some people who demand that you do it. Uh, in order to talk to you, they'll, they want to do it by encrypted uh, form. And, you know, in the government affidavits, it, it, it lays bare sort of their version of what happened. First of all, they, they were able to get your emails, your phone records, and so on, so they never really had to talk to you to, to see who you might be talking to. Oh, you mean in this other case? Yeah. Oh, right. And well, I guess... that's what they say. Right, that's what they say. Um, but one of the things they also point out is that the New York Times didn't publish this story. Right. Maybe you could... One of the, one of the things I'm curious about uh, is that the initial information that you got 10 years ago, right, about eavesdropping and so on, it took 14 months for that initial story to get in the pages of the New York Times. About the NSA. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 13. Why did it take so long? Uh, about the NSA story. Yeah. Uh, the original NSA eavesdropping story that sort of starts this whole thing. Well, the government, as soon as uh, we, you know, as soon as, after we had reported on the story and nailed it down, uh, we went to the government for comment, for comment, in fact. I went to uh, Michael Hayden, who was then the director of the NSA, and got him on the phone and uh, told him what we were writing. And, and uh, before he realized what he was doing, he had given me an on-the-record comment. <laughs> and then, as soon, very quickly after that, he and the Bush administration started putting pressure on my editors uh, demanding that we not run the story. And so that began a very long, very convoluted process uh, of uh, putting the story in, the, you know, deciding what to do about the story. Well, there was a recent uh, public editor comment about all this in the New York Times this Sunday, right. which was, I, I think, more transparent than, than in the past, right. Right. where the editors were regretting right. having held the story. Right, yeah, they were. That was a, it was interesting to read that, to get every, you know, with the perspective of time uh, to see what people are now willing to talk about. 
Uh, and I think that's, it did, uh, it, it was, I think, and I was quoted in that column as saying this, I think the, f the way that we finally got that story in the paper, paper really kind of broke the fever uh, within the New York Times and in the media generally about uh, the way in which we were dealing with the government. And I think it helped us become more aggressive and more uh, independent and kind of restored uh, a sense that you can't you know, go along with everything they're saying. I, I guess for, uh, what, the way I reflect on is, I remember try, proposing stories at the New York Times or with Frontline about how the terrorist threat might not be what it's all mm -hmm. said to be right. by the intelligence community right. and the administration, that the capabilities of Al Qaeda and its allies were not anything, they couldn't pull off a second wave attack, for right. instance, right, right afterwards, and then so on. And what the editors would say, or the executive producers would say is, yeah, but if we run a story like that, what happens if there is an attack? Right, yeah. That's the problem with a lot of these issues is that it's difficult to prove a negative. Uh, one of the problems with the coverage, for instance, on the pre-war the Iraqi intel, you know, weapons of mass destruction stories that, um, that at, before the war, you know, it's very difficult when one reporter brings in a story that's very specific, saying very specific things are about to happen or that the Iraqis have certain information or certain capabilities. And if you say, well, I don't, I don't think that's right, but you don't have the specific, you can't prove entirely, conclusively that that's wrong. So you're, you're kind of in this position while saying, this one reporter has all this stuff and you just say no. I mean, which way are the editors gonna, t you know, it's human nature to go with the person who has some specifics. Okay, well, um, I think we're about ready to open this up for questions. I think Ed, Wasserman was going to say a couple of things, and um, and we can find out what people sure. want to know. Um, by the way, the opening of the New York Times and the free discussion of what happened inside, you should read this uh, public editor comment in last Sunday's paper, but from a journalism point of view, it's a little bit of breath of fresh air after some explanations by the paper that just didn't make sense in the past. Before we start the Q&A, I want to acknowledge a couple people, three people in the audience um, who uh, deserve special note. Um, Daniel Ellsberg, the military analyst who in 1971 began <laughs> away. <laughs> sort of a, a hero in press annals. Um, Josh Wolf graduate of our program, please stand, who freelance journalist who was jailed in 2006 for refusing to turn over videotapes of the demonstration in San Francisco, and Bill Turner, Bill is here, yes, say hello, you, you've been singled out for praise, uh, he's taught First Amendment course at UC Berkeley the past 28 years as author of Figures of Speech, First Amendment Heroes and Villains. Um, we have time for questions. Please uh, keep your questions to the point, no filibustering, uh, and you're welcome, please, to, uh, we have people with microphones so that you can be r recorded in high fidelity. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for, you know, coming tonight and talking about this hugely important issue. Snowden, when he first came out, said that his biggest fear wasn't being killed. He assumed at that point that that would probably transpire, but that the American people would not really rise up um, against or, you know, in opposition to what they were learning about their government. And so I'm wondering what your sense is at this point in your coverage and taking stock of sort of public response to all the NSA revelations. Where are we with that? And what do you see if indeed the public isn't as concerned as it might be, what might be some antidotes to that in terms of coverage? 
I think one of the things that I try to remember as a reporter is I don't try to uh, write stories based on what political impact they're going to have. Um, I learned long ago that if you try to try to have an impact uh, politically, that you, then you're more of a social worker than a journalist. Uh, and uh, you tend to go the wrong direction. So I write stories and then I just take a sporting interest in whether it's having an impact or not. Uh, and I can, I've, that way I'm never disappointed. Uh, because after our stories on the NSA, uh, Congress endorsed it and uh, enshrined it in law. In the, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, Amendments Act of, of 2008, uh, which was voted on a bipartisan basis and which is now the basis for the bulk data collection that Snowden revealed. Uh, and so the, I believe, I, if I had to guess, I would bet that there'll be no legislative action uh, coming out of what's happened to, what Snowden's revealed. And if anything, there may be, um, the bulk collection may be even further enshrined into law, but that's just a guess. Hi, um, thank you very much for speaking here. Uh, we r really appreciate having you. What is at stake in this case, in your case, as it relates to press freedom and the protection of confidential news sources? Well, I think the, the basic issue really is um, can we continue as journalists to protect, can, can you offer a confidential, the uh, promise of confidentiality to someone who is, knows something going on in the government but um, doesn't want to come go public with that information because they know that they're job might be threatened or even or they may be forced to go to jail and if we cannot provide confidentiality and if that confidentiality can be threatened in court then very quickly people will realize that they can't trust reporters anymore and they will not be willing to go to reveal what's going wrong in the government and I think the end result will be uh, greater corruption and abuse of power in the government as the press is not able to hold people accountable. You know, just a, as a, a comment, there's also a crisis going on in, on the civil side, that is in the private sector. So we, theoretically, we can, there is, there is still standing in federal law some degree to which we can provide confidentiality when it involves a corporation or involves pri private individuals, let's say, of great wealth and power. But even there, the problem is becoming a willingness to sue, an ability to uh, track down our sources electronically, get access to it. So for, I think for us as a profession, the, and the reason I brought up the whole thing about the encrypted interview with Snowden, is that we're gonna have to learn new ways of doing things in order to get stories, in order to say to people in a truthful way that we can protect you. I think um, the, the lack of tradecraft, if you will, by journalists, particularly in Washington, and I observe coming from the other coast, just this relaxed attitude that existed in Washington for a long time of calling people on the phone from your office, you know, inside the CIA or wherever, having the conversation, maybe sending an email back and forth, that the era is over. And the, and the world of uh, having sources inside major corporations or other, uh, other places is going to become more of a, a guerrilla war, if you will. And, and the, the, the tools that we will need to protect people are things that we're going to have to get on top of. Otherwise, we're out of business. I was just curious, what kind of tactics did the Bush administration initially take when they were pressuring your editors? On the NSA story, uh, well, they said that uh, they said that the NSA program was the crown jewel of the government's uh, counterterrorism programs, and that if we revealed it, uh, 
We would be responsible for the deaths of many Americans. They'd have blood on their hands, is the quote. You know, Lowell, the, uh, the lack of tradecraft, which you just said, and, and James, you were talking about um, the status quo. I mean, you are part of the establishment. The New York Times, Simon & Schuster, you're out there on the front lines trying to get information out, yet the war to get information to the public when it comes to, I mean, I mean, you think about propaganda and Fox News and how folks are not really conducive. I mean, reporters have been demonized to some respect. How, how is there, how, how do you push back, especially on the local level, with all these challenges that we face like consolidation, media consolidation. I mean, we don't have the resources anymore to go out there and do our job. And you have the establishment, you have Washington, you have Congress, you have the White House fighting the fifth estate. I mean, mm -hmm. what can we do? <laughs> no, I mean, I think that's... I, go ahead. Um, I guess um, I wrote a little thing here, but uh, I was asked not to do it because it might depress you. Um, <laughs> But uh, let me just tell you that history is, uh, I think Aristotle is right, history repeats itself. And, um, you know, uh, 50 years ago, the United States, uh, despite unprecedented prosperity, was plagued by poverty. Millions of people were disenfranchised, living in fear, treated as chattel. And the government was engaged in covert operations and undeclared wars here and around the world. And the press was cowed. Today, despite unprecedented accumulation of wealth, we are still plagued by poverty and have in our midst a population that is disenfranchised, living in fear. I'm talking about all of the undocumented immigrants. And we're involved in open warfare and covert operations. And as Jim Risen has reported here at, at, you know, covert operations here at home. And now the press is being prosecuted. So, not a very pretty picture, uh, but at the same time, I can tell you that the struggle that went on from that, because I'm old enough to remember it and get involved in it, and that's one of the reasons I think we're here tonight, that created the freedom, for instance, to do this kind of reporting. This kind of reporting didn't exist 50 years ago. And, and when it did, and I'll one, one last comment on it, when it did, there was a book that was coming out in 1964 called The Invisible Government, and it was the first time that the CIA's covert operations overthrowing governments around the world were revealed in a book. The head of the CIA uh, took, got the authors to come into the CIA and admonish them, told them, don't publish this book, and if you do, there will be serious consequences. They published the book anyway. There was an attempt, covert attempt, by the CIA to discredit the book and the authors, okay? That head of the CIA, it didn't, didn't work. Actually, there was, a, in a sense, after that, the beginnings of open reporting, Ramparts Magazine, other people started reporting on, let's say, the NSA, which used to be known as no such agency. Um, and, but what happened to the head of the CIA who did that? His name is on a building right down the street here. His name was John McCone. So, this struggle and this battle has been going on for a long time, and I think, you know, we win and we lose. And we have to learn new ways of doing business, basically. Classified information is, by its nature, is abused by the government. Is there any role for classified information in the government, and what balance can there ever be between the government classifying information and reporters dealing with what the government is trying to keep secret, what balance could there ever be? Well, there's, you know, sure. I mean, I think it's, uh, this is, gets to the heart of the battle between the press and the government. The government thinks they should be the ones who decide what classified information can eventually be made public. The press has a view that whatever we find out about, we get to decide what we print. We're the ultimate arbiters of what goes into our own publications. What, but that doesn't mean that we don't negotiate. 
and that we don't have meetings and discussions that go on all the time between the government and the press uh, to decide and have informal discussions and formal discussions about uh, what to print. And that happens all the time. And um, if you listen to the way the government talks about leaks, you would never know. I mean, they don't like to admit how much the press cooperates with them, uh, even on you know, very sensitive stories that ultimately run, but which you know, we've given them opportunities to discuss beforehand. So it's, it's, uh, far, it's far more give and take than they want to admit that there is. Yeah, I think the press in general is, is, is much more responsible. I mean, just give you, forget classified information. If, generally speaking, if you find out about a law enforcement operation where people are undercover, for instance, and maybe in danger, you generally speaking, you hold the story. You don't do it. There's a sort of a common sense rule that, that's out there. It gets violated, it's messy, it, doesn't, it, it isn't any better than the government's own decision-making process internally, but it's worked for a long period of time. That's why people, I think, e even though, uh, you know, it's said that the public doesn't uh, respect the press or we don't have a high standing, in fact, when things happen, they tune in. And, and so, does, so do the people in the government. The problem is, the, the basic problem is that the government has taken, in my opinion, they've taken advantage in the last few years of the fact that the press is willing to engage with them when, before a story runs. And they've abused that process in many cases. And, and instead of recognizing that there are certain times we're going to agree with them, and certain times we're, they're not. They've launched all these leak investigations, and um, then made public statements attacking the press that were really, you know, not did not represent what really happened in in many of those cases. And um, so that, and and they they've also cried wolf so many times that where they claim that something is vital to national security when it really wasn't and they knew it wasn't. So if I could just jump in, Jim, the chapter that's gotten you in trouble in this book, what were the arguments? Did you get arguments for the government why you shouldn't be running it? And yeah. what did, those, what did yeah. those arguments look like? Well, the same thing. They argued national security as they always do. Uh, and uh, they would always say that uh, there's as they say many times, they, would, they said this is one of our best operations, uh, when in fact uh, it wasn't. And um, that's, so I, you know, I eventually was uh, convinced that it was the right thing to do was to run the story. I think when you have a, uh, I think the, the default position for a reporter and for a publication always should be to publish. Uh, unless the arguments by the government are so overwhelming that um, you, don't, you can't counter the argument. I think in the war on terror, as I, I said some, this to somebody else today, was the war on terror essentially has been the first war in American history where it's been entirely waged in secret. The entire global war on terror is classified. And so virtually everything since 9-11 that the United States government has done in national security has, that you now know about has came because of disclosures in the media. There's been virtually no, nothing announced by the government about anything that wasn't first in the press. You would have gone from 9-11 until the death of Osama bin Laden not knowing anything. And then 10 years later, you would have had 9-11, and then you would have had Barack Obama come out and say, we killed Osama bin Laden. And you would say, well, what happened in between? <laughs> Your prosecution has obvious psychological and you know, personal implications, but I think one of the biggest ones to journalism in itself is this notion of self-censorship. I think that's kind of the point of it. 
Um, I was wondering if you had any practical advice on how to avoid that, or if you can give any advice to young journalists on how to overcome that idea where I should or should not publish this story based on what might happen to me. Based on what, I'm sorry, based on what, happened to what you. might happen to me. As, I mean, well, prosecution, the government what happened to you? you? No, I think you just, it's, yeah, that's a good question. I think you've got to just uh, decide. What, I can tell you what I did on these stories, those stories, the NSA story and this Iran story, and my book generally. It was a, it was a very fundamental conversation I had with myself in which I said, I'm either going to publish these stories or I'm going to get out of journalism. And so I published the stories. And if I hadn't, I was going to get out of journalism. So that's the question you should ask yourself. So if we are ever going to have a reporter's privilege in a federal uh, court context, it'll either be through legislative means or through judicial means, and you're currently uh, in the process of fighting this in the courts. Um, <clears throat> what is your, your take on the sort of long-term process that's been going on for quite a while around the, the SHIELD law, or the so-called uh, Free Flow of Information Act of 2006, 7, 8, 10, 12, <laughs> and now third. Right. I guess we're still in 2012 for the law, but what's your take on the, the SHIELD law and uh, all the exemptions that are carved into it to the point that it almost looks like Swiss cheese? Right. Yeah, you know, I'm obviously not a, uh, I don't know every detail of the current law uh, or current legislation, um, but my general take on it has been that I think it would be a very bad law. Uh, I think the problem is, as you point out, they have exceptions for national security reporting, a loophole where it won't apply. Uh, and the only times it would apply is when the Justice Department gets to make a balancing test of their own to decide whether a national security story, whether the, the public service value of a national security story outweighed the damage to national security. And they then could decide to, uh, whether or not to provide some protection to the reporter based on that balancing test done by the Justice Department. Um, in effect, you're setting up a bunch of bureaucrats at the Justice Department as the, as the final arbiters of what is acceptable journalism in America and what's not. And I think it's a backdoor official secrets act, which is the British law that bans certain kinds of journalism. Uh, and so I think it's bans yeah. this kind of journalism. Yeah, I think it would have very bad unintended consequences and would have virtually no positive effects for journalists, especially in Washington, where almost all of the leak investigations are about national security. Just wondering, you know, you're a marked man now, and I'm wondering how you continue to do your job. Um, are sources still willing to discuss with you? classified information and also the <coughs> fact that you're encrypting your communications isn't going to prevent them from knowing who you're talking to. So I'm wondering if you're having problems with that. Well, I think uh, I found that um, at first it was difficult for me to, if, when, it, when this process first started, it was harder on me. Uh, as I said, it kind of dominated things for a while. But now I find actually that um, it's helpful people uh, now know that I'm, I'll protect my sources, and so I've had people come to me and say, um, I'm willing to talk to you because I know you're, you'll protect me. And so it's kind of like, in a weird way, good advertising. <laughs> so. This is, uh, this is, uh kind of a follow-up to Josh's question about the shield law. Putting aside for a moment the Swiss cheese shield law, the bad shield law that is now on the table in Washington, there are executives at very prestigious news organizations who believe that we shouldn't have shield laws. Uh, they say we shouldn't have shield laws because in the case of, of one, one of these executives, A, we have a shield law, it's called the First Amendment. 
And B, shield laws require that you actually sit down and negotiate with officials in the government, elected officials, and that that is somehow dirtying our hands in a way that we shouldn't be. And I just wonder what your view is about that position. I, I mean, I think I, I, uh, I go back and forth on that, uh, whether or not it depends. I think it de all depends on the, the type of shield law that you could get. Uh, I think the state shield laws seem to work better because they don't have these, nas these big loopholes, at least as far as I know. Uh, the, the problem is that in Washington, no one wants to protect national security reporting. And so that's the baseline that all of the politicians, all the legislatures, legislators, everybody in the executive branch is coming to. They're, they're not gonna do anything that will protect national security reporting. And so they're creating this monster of a law that, in my opinion, the media industry has gone along with because it's, they think it's the best thing they can get and none of the lobbyists or people involved with these efforts of trying to get, you know, from the newspaper industry or some of the other organizations, none of them have ever done national security reporting. They don't really care that it, it will harm that, they just seem to want to get something passed. And I think, I think there's like this fever in the uh, industry, well, let's get something without realizing how bad this is gonna be. But, but if I can follow it up just for a second, but the issue is a, a slightly different th that I'm raising, which is the idea that you sit down and you have to negotiate and there is an automatic assumption of quid pro quo. So that includes state shield laws. In California, we have a great one, but there's a, a view among some media executives that we shouldn't be in those negotiations, period. Well, those already happen anyway on an informal basis. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what, what you get out of that at the federal level when we already do that on an informal basis. Uh, I think you'd have to, to make that statutory is an interesting question, I don't know. But I think the, uh, the problem I have, I mean, I'd, I'd be open to a shield law if you crafted it correctly, but I just think this one is terrible. Um, I wouldn't object to that if you got something in return for it. No, just a, a California law, which is usually recognized as one of the best in the country and actually gets better all the time. It was just amended. Um, I remember when it came about, there was no shield law, I think back in 1973, and it was the Manson trial. And there was an LA Times reporter named Bill Farr, really well-liked guy who was, co who was covering it every day. And every day he had a scoop on the front page of the Los Angeles Times about what the attorneys and the judge talked about in chambers and so on and so on. And finally the judge kept saying in open court, you know, pointing to the attorneys saying, stop talking to the press. The next day, everything that happened in the chambers was in Bill Farr's article. So he brought Bill Farr into the well of the court and he said, Mr. Farr, who told you? And Farr said, I can't tell you, Your Honor. And the, he ordered the bailiff to take Farr, Farr to jail until he would talk. And he stayed there for the rest of the trial. And that resulted in the California Shield Law. So it does take that kind of confrontation, I think, to get a better law, if you will. Especially, you're not going to get a good, I don't think you're going to get a good decision out of the Supreme Court. And you're definitely not getting any sympathy whatsoever from the Obama administration. So I think we're stuck at this point. I don't think we'll get a good law and I don't think we'll get good court decisions for quite a while. To James, I think uh, Lowell just gave you an invitation to jail there. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the reason I invited him is I figure I'm going to at some point, so I wanted to make sure I had friends. <laughs> I'll be rooting for you all the way. <laughs> uh, this conversation has been, uh, for the last couple of years, basically in the national security realm, and re reporting there, and that, that's where the criminal threat is. I want to ask what um, degree you see this emboldening this kind of behavior elsewhere, both in federal agencies, federal courts, and, and even in the states. Well, you've had other cases, obviously. You had the Balco case here in San Francisco. Uh, there's, 
I think the problem is if you, once they start doing it in one area, there, there's no reason why they can't do it in other kind of reporting areas. Uh, and so I think that's, that's the real danger. Uh, I mean, by the way, there, there are cases of reporters and I, for instance, that aren't covered very much. So I, I just forgot her name, but there's, an, there's a Fox News reporter in New York who reported on the shootings in the theater in Colorado and had a law enforcement source. She, the Colorado shield law doesn't, isn't very good, but New York courts are currently deciding whether to ship her to Colorado to testify. So this is an ongoing process that I don't think we've ever, ever had a free zone to do whatever we wanted. I think right. the key question really right now though around Jim's case and related cases, as Ed Wasserman pointed out, is we have an unprecedented president in terms of prosecuting the press and going after our sources and making it illegal what we do. And I don't think that that's gotten very much coverage in the media. And, and it's really quite surprising because it's the media, in a sense, that made Obama. At least that's what the Republicans say. <laughs> and, and yet you're getting just the opposite of what you would expect. Um, thanks for coming. I'm just curious to know um, what your expectation is if the Supreme Court picks up your case. Um, do you have an idea of um, you know, the argument, an argument that you're making? Are you sort of maybe just relating it to your specific, specific facts of your case? or? Are you um, going the Brandsburg route um, of trying to create a press exemption? Wow, it's pretty advanced. Uh, you should talk to my lawyers. They're the ones who are going to do the briefs. I don't know all the details. Uh, the, uh, but I mean, basically, it's we're going to argue around this central issue that there is a reporter's privilege in the Constitution, the First Amendment and common law uh, provide. Uh, for a reporter's privilege, and the government is arguing the opposite. And um, that's going to be the central issue if the court takes it. Um. I have a question. Um, I mean, you have the source who you may go to jail to protect. I'm wondering what the source, what the source's reaction, like, have they said thank you? Like, what? What have they said to you? I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm not going to discuss anything specific about my case. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So far, primarily I've been talking about um, fairly mainstream media, you know, 60 Minutes, um, New York Times, uh, Frontline, so on and so forth. Um, and in the past, obviously, these organizations have served as a kind of gatekeeper for um, stories and things. And you talk about the um, informal negotiations that go on all the time. Does the calculus change at all with the advent of all of the kinds of uh, alternative um, news dissemination, blogosphere, and so on and so forth, which doesn't have the same kind of internal gatekeeping. Well, I think that internal gatekeeping is, is being created at the new organizations pretty rapidly. Uh, and I think that's one of the really interesting things. P things that people didn't consider mainstream five years ago are now mainstream. Uh, like the Huffington Post which uh, didn't exist a few years ago. Or, you know, you know things are popping up all, every day. Al Jazeera America is now on the air. So I think the, the media landscape keeps changing, but the central process of writing or producing stories for print or broadcast or for the internet it's just different mediums. They're all the same. It's the same process. Uh, you know, people always talk about the new media. Well, the new media is the New York Times because we have the largest or one of the largest online news presences there is. Uh, so it really doesn't matter. It's just what you write is what you write accurate. 
And is what you write or what you say on television in the public interest? It doesn't matter what medium you did it in. Who would have thought that you would be sharing a byline with Laura Poitras? Right, yeah. In the New York Times. Hi. Um, there's been a lot of attention put on the intent behind sources and whistleblowers. And I was wondering if you feel like there is any public interest relevance to the intent of sources, or if that's just a distraction. That's a good question. I think that is a distraction. That in my uh, experience as a reporter, uh, it all, it doesn't matter what someone tells you, it's what you can prove after you've heard something. And uh, you never, you know, the story that you print ultimately is either true or not true. Uh, and it doesn't matter in the end why, where, or how you got that story. Um, it's, it matters whether you wrote it accurately and provided the proper context for it and whether it's fair uh, and newsworthy. And uh, I don't believe that, if you're doing your job right, where you got the story doesn't matter. If you, it's only when you did your st didn't do your job right that really there are legitimate questions about where you got it. Jim Risen, thank you very much for making the trip across country to be with us. Thank you, Lowell. And I want to mention people who brought this amazing evening uh, together, that, that amazing repast and, and uh, this event together. Marlena Telvik, Alicia Klatt, Julie Hirano, Linnea Edmire, Janice Hui, and Roya Ferrazares. Thanks so much for your hard work. And thank all of you for turning out. <laughs>